everyone, Ari here, and welcome back to, I mean, welcome to, not welcome back to, but welcome to a new series of reviews I'm going to be doing this month called Marvel May. So for this month, I'm going to be looking at all the films in phase one of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, from Iron Man all the way to the first Avengers. And then next year will be phase two, and then phase three, and so on and so forth. So there you go. And I will be ranking these movies from one to five infinity gauntlets everybody got that good all right so let's kick things off with the one that started it all the very first iron man from 2008 so i'll be looking at the the plot the production as well as the music of as and all that other fun stuff so without further ado here we go tony stark who has inherited the defense contractor Stark Industries from his father is in war torn Afghanistan with his military with his friend and military liaison Lieutenant Colonel James Rhodes to demonstrate the new Jericho missile. After the demonstration, the convoy is ambushed and Stark is critically wounded by a rocket propelled grenade by, used by the attackers, one of his company's own. He is captured and imprisoned in a cave by a terrorist group called the Ten Rings. Jensen, a fellow captive who is a doctor, implants an electromagnet in Stark's chest to keep the shrapnel shards that wounded him from reaching his heart and killing him. Ten Rings leader Raza offers Stark freedom in exchange for building a Jericho missile for the group, but Tony and Yinsen know that Raza will not keep his word. Stark and Yinsen built a secretly built a small, powerful electric generator called an arc reactor to power Stark's electromagnet and a prototypical suit of powered armor to aid in their escape. Although they keep the suit hidden almost to completion, the Ten Rings discover their hostages' intentions and attack the workshop. Yinsen sacrifices himself to divert them while the suit is completed. The armored Stark battles his way out of the cave to find the dying Yinsen, then burns the Ten Rings' weapons in anger and flies away, crashing in the desert and destroying the suit. After being rescued by Rhodes, Stark returns home and announces that his company will no longer manufacture weapons. Obadiah Stane, his father's old partner and the company's manager, it advises Stark that this may ruin Stark Industries and his father's legacy. In his home workshop, Stark built a sleeker, more powerful version of his improvised armor suit as well as a more powerful arc reactor for his chest. Personal assistant Pepper Potts places the original reactor inside a small glass showcase. The same request details a suspicious Stark decides to keep his work to himself. Good idea. In a charity event held by Stark Industries, Reporter Christine Everhart informs Stark that his company's weapons were recently delivered to the Ten Rings and are being used to attack Ginson's home village, Glamira. Stark then learns that Stan has been arms trafficking to criminals worldwide and is agent Coop to replace him as Stark Industries CEO. Stark dons his new armor and flies to Afghanistan, where he saves the villagers. While flying home, Stark is shot at by two F-22 Raptor fighter jets. He reveals his secret identity to Rose over the phone in an attempt to end the attack. Meanwhile, the Ten Rings gather the pieces of Stark's prototype suit and meet with Stane, who subdues Raza and has the rest of the group killed. Stane has a massive new suit reverse engineered from the wreckage. Seeking to track his company's illegal shipments, Stark sends Potts to hack into its database. She then discovers that Stane hired the Ten Rings to kill Stark, but the group reneged. Potts meets with Agent Phil Coulson of S.H.I.E.L.D., an intelligence agency, to inform him of Stane's activities. Stane scientists cannot duplicate Stark's miniaturized arc reactor, so Stane ambushes Stark at his home and takes the one from his chest. Well, that sucks. Stark manages to get to his original reactor to replace it. Yay! Poss and several S.H.I.E.L.D. agents attempt to arrest Stane, but he dons his suit and attacks them. Stark fights Stane, but is outmatched without his new reactor to run his suit at full capacity. The fight carries Stark and Stane to the top of the Stark Industries building, as Stark instructs Pepper to overload the large arc reactor powering the building. This unleashes a massive electrical surge that causes Stain and his armor to fall into the exploding reactor, killing him. The next day, at a press conference, Stark defies suggestions from S.H.I.E.L.D. And publicly, and publicly admits to being Iron Man. In a post credit scene, S.H.I.E.L.D. director Nick Fury visits Stark at home, telling him that Iron Man is not the only superhero in the world, and explaining that he wants to discuss the Avenger Initiative. Hmm. Alright, well, let's look at the production of this whole thing, beginning with the development. Yeah. 
Okay, there we go. In April 1990, Universal Studios bought the rights to develop Iron Man for the big screen, with Stuart Gordon to direct a low-budget film based on the property. By February 1996, 20th Century Fox had acquired the rights from Universal. In January 1997, Nicolas Cage expressed interest in portraying the character, while in September 1998, Tom Cruise expressed interest in producing as well as starring in an Iron Man film. Jeff Ventar and Iron Man co-creator Stan Lee co-wrote a story for Fox, which Ventar adapted into a screenplay. It included a new science fiction origin for the character and featured Modoc as the villain. Tom Rothman, president of production at Fox, credited the screenplay with finally making him understand the character. In May 1990, Jeffrey Kane was hired to rewrite Ventar and Lee's script. That October, Quentin Tarantino was approached to write and direct the film. Fox sold the rights to New Line Cinema the following December, reasoning that although the Ventar Lee script was strong, the studio had too many Marvel superheroes in development, and quote, we can't make them all. By July 2000, the film was being written for New Line by Ted Elliott, Terry Rossio, and Tim, and Tim McCanlice. McCann Sorry, I put you that. McCanlice's script used the idea of a Nick Fury cameo to set up his own film. In June 2001, Nolan entered talks with Joss Whedon, a fan of the character, to direct, and in December 2002, McCanley's turn had turned in a completed script. In December 2004, the attached director Nick Casavetes to the project for a Target 2006 release. Screenplay drafts written by Alfred Golf, Miles Millar, and David Hayter. Impended oh, screenplay drafts were written by Alfred Golf, Miles Millar, and David Hayter and put an Iron Man against his father, Howard Stark, who becomes War Machine. After two years of unsuccessful development and the deal with Casavetes falling through, New Line returned the film rights to Marvel. In November 2005, Marvel Studios worked to start development from scratch and announced Iron Man as their first independent feature, as the character was their only major one not already depicted in live action. According to associate producer Jeremy Lactum, I guess I probably mispronounced that, Quote, we, went after a, we went after about 30 writers and they all passed, saying they were uninterested in the project due to both the relative obscurity of the character and it being a solely Marvel production. Even the rewrites when the film had a script led to many refusals. In order to build awareness for Iron Man from the general public and put him on the same level of popularity as Spider-Man or Hulk, Marvel conducted focus groups to help remove the general perception that the character was a robot. After the groups proved, su proved successful, the information Marvel received helped them formulate an, an awareness building plan, which included releasing three animated shorts ahead of the film's release. The shorts were called Iron Man Advertorials and were produced by Tim Miller and Blur Studio. Huh. Now on to pre-production. John Favreau was hired to direct the film in April 2006, celebrating getting a job by going on a diet and losing, losing 70 pounds. Wow. Favreau had wanted to work with Marvel producer Avi Arad on another film after they both worked on Daredevil. Huh, I actually never, did not know that. Hmm. The director found the opportunity to create a, a politically ambitious, quote, ultimate spy movie in Iron Man, citing inspiration from Tom, from Tom Clancy, James Bond, and Robocop, and compared his approach to an independent film, quote, if Robert, if Robert Altman had directed Superman and Batman Begins. Favreau wanted to make Iron Man a story of an adult man literally reinventing himself after discovering the world is far more complex than he originally believed. He changed the Vietnam War origin of the character to Afghanistan, as he did not want to do a period piece. Art Markham and Matt Holloway were hired to write the script, while Mark Fergus and Hawk Oxby wrote another version, with Favreau compiling both teams' scripts, with John August then, quote, polishing the combined version. Comic book staff Mark Millar Brian Michael Bendis, Joe Quesada, Tom Brevard, Alex Alonso, and Ralph Macchio, not to be confused with the actor of the same name, were called upon by Favreau to give advice on the script. Favreau planned to cast a newcomer in the title role, as, quote, Those movies don't require an expensive star. Iron Man's a star. The superhero is a star. The success of X-Men and Spider-Man without being star-driven pieces reassures executives that the film does have an upside commercially. However, in September 2006, Robert Downey Jr. was cast in the role. Favreau chose Downey, a fan of the comic, 
because he felt the actor's past made him an appropriate choice for the part, explaining, quote, The best and worst moments of Robert's life have been in the public eye. He had to find an inner balance to overcome obstacles that went far beyond his career. That's Tony Stark. Favreau faced opposition from Marvel and casting Downey, would not take no for an answer, saying, quote, It was my job as a director to show that it was the best choice creatively. Everybody knew that he was ta- everybody knew he was talented, and certainly by studying the Iron Man role and developing the script that I realized with that script, I realized that the character seemed to line up with Robert in all the good and bad ways. Downey earned five hundred thousand for the role. While preparing for filming, Favreau and Downey were given a tour of SpaceX by Elon Musk. Downey said, quote, Elon was someone Tony probably hung out with and hung out with a party with or more likely, they went on some weird jungle trek together to drink concoctions with the shamans. <laughs> yeah, I could definitely see them doing that. Additional casting for the film occurred over the next few months. Terrence Howard was announced in the role of Stark's best friend Jim Rhodes in October 2006. Gwyneth Paltrow was cast as love interest Virginia Pepper Potts in January 2007. And Jeff Bridges was cast in an undisclosed role in February. Choosing character to be the villain of the film was difficult. As Favreau felt Iron's, Iron Man's arch nemesis, the Mandarin, would not feel realistic, especially after Mark Millar gave his opinion on the script. He felt only in a sequel, with an altered tone, would the fantasy of the Mandarin's rings be appropriate. <laughs> yeah, just wait till we get to Iron Man 3. The decision to push him into the background is comparable to Sauron in Lord of the Rings, or Palpatine in Star Wars. Favreau also wanted Iron Man to face a giant enemy. The switch from Mandarin to Obadiah Stane was done after Bridges was cast in that role. Was Stane originally intended to become a villain in the sequel? Yeah, too bad that never happened. The Crimson Dynamo was also a villain in the early drafts of the script. Favreau felt it was important to include intentional inside references for fans of the comics, such as giving the two fire jets that attack Iron Man the call signs of Whiplash 1 and Whiplash 2, a reference to the comic book villain Whiplash, and including Captain America's shield in Stark's workshop. Favreau, Favreau wanted the film to be believable by, believable by showing the construction of the Iron Man suit in its three stages. Stan Winston, a fan of the comic, and his company, who worked with Favreau on Zathura, built metal and rubber versions of the armors. The Mark I design was intended to look like it was built from spare parts. The back is less armored than the front because Stark would use his resources for a forward attack. It also foreshadows the design of Stan's armor. Mm-hmm. A single 90-pound version was built, causing concern when a stuntman fell over inside it. The both the stuntman and the suit were unscathed. The armor was also designed to have only its top half worn at times. Stan Winston Studios built a 10-foot, 800-pound animatronic version of Ironmonger, Obadiah Stane, a name which Obadiah Stane calls Tony Stark and himself in the, in the, earlier in the film as a reference, but was never, actually give, was never actually used for the suit itself in the film. Hmm, I wonder why. The animatronic, the animatronic required five operators for the arm, and was built on a gimbal to simulate walking. A scale model was used for the shots of it being built. The Mark II resembles an airplane prototype with visible flaps. Iron Man comic book artist Adi Granov designed the Mark III with illustrator Phil Saunders. Granov's designs were the primary inspiration for the films, and he came on board the film after he recognized his work on John Favreau's MySpace page. Yeah, that ever goes to show, show you how dated that was. Sunder streamlined Granoff's concept art, making it stealthier and less cartoonish in its proportions, and also designed the War Machine armor, but it was, quote, cut from the script about halfway through pre-production. Aww. He explained that the War Machine armor, quote, was going to be called the Mark IV armor and would have weaponized swap-out parts that would be worn over the original Mark III armor, and that it, quote, would have been worn by Tony Stark in the final battle sequence. Yeah, too bad that never happened. Anywho, let's move on to filming. Production was based in the former Hughes Company's sound stages in Playa Vista, Los Angeles, California. Howard Hughes was one of the inspirations for the comic book, and the filmmakers acknowledged the coincidence that they would film Iron Man creating the Mark III armor where the Hughes H4 Hercules was built. Nice. Favreau rejected the East Coast setting of the comic books because many superhero films had already been set there. Yeah, I don't think we need more of East Coast superheroes. Let's focus on some. Let's focus on some of the West Coast, shall we? (laughs) 
Filming began on March 12, 2007, with the first few weeks spent on Stark's captivity in Afghanistan. The cave where Stark is imprisoned was a 150 to 200 yard long set, which had movable forks in the caverns to allow greater freedom for the film's crew. Production designer J. Michael Riva saw footage of a Taliban fighter in Afghanistan and saw the cold breath as he spoke. Realizing remote caves are actually very cold, Riva placed an air conditioning system in the set. Good idea. He also saw Denny's advice about makeshift objects in prison, such as a sock being used to make tea. Okay. Afterwards, Stark's capture was filmed at Lone Pine, and other exterior scenes in Afghanistan were filmed at Olancha Sand Dunes, where the crew endured two days of 40 to 60 mile per hour winds. Yikes. Filming at Edwards Air Force Base began in mid-April and ended on May 2nd. Exterior shots of Stark's home were digitally added to footage of Point Doom in Malibu, while the interior was built at Playa Vista, where Favreau and Riva aimed to make Stark's home look less futuristic and more, quote, grease monkey. Filming concluded on June 25, 2007, at Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada. Favreau, a newcomer in action films, remarked, quote, I'm shocked that I was on schedule. I thought there were going to be many curveballs. He hired, quote, people who are good at creating action, so, quote, the human story felt like it belongs to the comic book genre. Mm -hmm. There was much improvisation in dialogue scenes because the script is not completed when filming began. The filmmakers had focused on the story making sense and planning the action. Favreau felt that improvisation would make the film feel more natural. Some scenes were shot with two cameras to capture lines set on the spot. Multiple takes were done as Danny wanted to try something new each time. It was Danny's idea to have Stark hold a news conference on the floor, and he created the speech Stark makes when demonstrating the Jericho weapon. Bridges described this approach as, quote, a $200 million student film, and noted that it causes stress, it caused stress for Marvel executives when the stars were trying to come up with dialogue on the day of filming scenes. He also noted in some instances, that in some instances, he and Danny would swap characters for a rehearsal to see how their own lines sounded. The dialogue for the Nick Fury cameo was also changed on the set, with comic book writer Brian Michael Bendis providing three pages of dialogue for the part, and filmmakers choosing the best lines for filming on set. The Nick Fury cameo was filmed with the skeleton crew in order to keep it a secret, but rumors appeared on the internet only days later. How? Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige subsequently had the scene removed from all preview prints in order to maintain the surprise and keep fans guessing. Mm -hmm. Now on to post-production. Favreau's main concern with the film's effects was whether the transition between the computer-generated and practical, co practical costumes would be too obvious. He hired Industrial Light and Magic to create the bulk of the visual effects for the film after seeing Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End and Transformers. The orphanage and the assembly did additional work, with the latter creating a digital version of the Mark I armor. To help with animating the more refined suits, information was sometimes captured by having Downey wear only the helmet, sleeves, and chest of the costume over a motion capture suit, and skydivers were filmed in a vertical wind tunnel to study the physics of flying. For shots of the Mark III flying, it was animated to look realistic by taking off slowly and landing quickly. To generate shots of Iron Man and the F-22 Raptors battling, cameras were flown in the air to provide reference for physics, wind, and frost on the lenses. Huh. And now finally, the music. There we go, okay. Composer Ramin Javadi, who also composes the score for Game of Thrones, had been a fan of the character of I had been a fan of the character Iron Man as a child, seeing that he always liked superheroes, quote, that don't actually that actually don't have any superpowers. Mm -hmm. After Favreau's previous collaborator, John Debney, was unavailable to score the film, Javadi sought out the role himself. Favreau had a clear vision of heavy metal music and guitars for the project seeing that Tony Stark was more of a rock star than a traditional superhero. Yep, that's definitely true. Jawadi subsequently, subsequently composed most of the film's score on guitar before arranging it for orchestra. Jawadi had help with arrangements and additional cues from Hans Zimmer and Remote Control Productions, arranging against the machine guitarist Tom Morello, who makes a cameo appearance in the film, contributing guitar performances to the score. The film also features a big band style arrangement of the Iron Man theme song for the 1966 cartoon The Marvel Superheroes from frequent Favreau collaborators John O'Brien and Rick Boston. 
A soundtrack featuring Jawadi's score was released by Lionsgate Records on April 29, 2008. Cool. So overall, as the beginning of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the Iron Man franchise, it's really darn good, and I definitely think it stood the test of time, and yeah, Ron Hayes has aged quite a bit. I mean, the film is like almost like, what, 11 years old? It's still pretty darn good overall. So overall, I give Iron Man 1 5 Infinity Gauntlets out of 5. Well, tune in tomorrow as we take a look at The Incredible Hulk. The movie, of course, not the TV show. <laughs> Anywho, so until tomorrow, stay strong, true believers.